Hello, everybody. I am Ashley Stunkel from Security Health Plan, and I wanted to welcome you to Security Health Plan Academy. We're excited to bring you this monthly webinar series to provide you with information important to your health, your wellness, and healthcare insurance. Our plan is to bring you a new topic each month. Today, we are happy to have Marshville Clinic Health System psychologist, Dr. Jacob Dieselman, here with us to present our first webinar on mental health wellness. I want to remind everybody, if you have a question, please feel free to submit that via the chat feature. We will try our best to answer as many questions as possible during today's presentation. So without further ado, Jacob, do you want to take it away? Perfect. <clears throat> well, quickly, Ashley or whoever else is coordinating, can you all hear me? Yes? We can. Great. And then you're seeing the slides I have up, yes? Yes. Looks great. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> and I'm going to keep my face up because, I don't know, it feels better to have a, a face to a voice. So um, hopefully it's not in the way of anyone's screen when they're watching um, at home. So as you can see here, uh, this first topic is mental health wellness, taking care of your whole self. Um, uh, my name, you know, a little bit of my uh, qualifications and background here. I do have an email listed. Um, feel free to, um, you know, anyone can contact me. I know it's a, I'm giving a big permission there, but um, I'd rather people uh, reach out for whatever reasons and we figure out what to do than to people be quiet about stuff that's going on. Um, and I think I wanted to point out, this was an error on my part. I think in the flyer, it said something to the effect of a director of a perinatal health clinic. I am not that. <laughs> um, I am a psychologist. I do work here. I am licensed. I do a lot of things. I don't do that. Um, so I just wanted to be kind of clear. Um, so as we get rolling here, hopefully as I get rolling, there we go. Um, kind of a thing we always say, I, uh, no conflicts of interest, nothing about this presentation needs to be disclosed. Uh, who knows, one day I might have something to disclose, that would be fun, but not now. So uh, what I'll be covering today uh, with you all is going to be why mental health, specific uh, considerations for older populations, you know, what is wellness and, and well-being, um, what is emotional psychological stress, how do we cope with that, and what to do with resources, uh, uh, getting extra support, and once something's been identified, what do we do um, beyond just taking care of ourselves if there's more uh, need? And then, of course, questions and um, answers if we have time or if it makes sense to do. A um, couple things. Uh, 25 minutes for mental health and mental health wellness is an incredibly short amount of time. So this is really a, a primer a introduction, a way for you all to get some information and start to further explore what's important, what's needed, what's um, connected to your all's need and to help you grow and to have some valuable information to keep moving on with. Um, it'd be silly for me to think I could distill everything that I've learned, done, practiced, and everything out there into 25 minutes. Um, anything else I wanna add? Um, yeah. Um, you know, and when we think wellness and we start going mental health, um, I hope that this presentation, I hope that generally with SHP, I hope that globally and on a societal level that we're starting to take um, psychological, cognitive, overall emotional health and well-being just as seriously and as important as our physical health. Um, you know, I'm sure maybe some people have seen this shift and I definitely am aware of it. You know, at one point, People would never have said, why are you going jogging? Um, they'd have been like, what are you running from? And now we're like, no, no, you, you do that for your physical health. Well, I hope the same shift can be made um, with paying attention to your psychological, emotional well-being. It is part of who we are, and it's going to help us to stay functional and to live uh, happy, long, productive lives. All right. So, you know, why mental health matters. <clears throat> Oh, my face is in the way of my own screen. Uh, let me slide that around. So, uh, you know, anytime, any at any one time, around 30% of the American population has a diagnosable psychiatric disorder. Um, you know, and approximately 50% of people will uh, have a diagnosable significant me mental health concern in their lifetime. 
In fact, that 50% number is kind of on the conservative side. Some studies and some research shows it might be as high as 80% of people. So basically, I want to point out, um, this is something we're all probably going to experience as something that's important to everybody. I want to normalize and take away some of the stigma. Mental health concerns does not mean that someone's weak, broken, and incapable. It means that they're human and they need to pay attention to getting those needs addressed. Um, unfortunately, what we see is that only about 20% of those with um, a diagnosable presenting concern see a specialty mental health provider. Um, and uh, uh, about 20 other percent see people in a primary care setting, but upwards of 60% or more um, don't see anybody. So we're definitely neglecting this when it comes to taking care of ourselves. So in respect to um, an aging population, people are older, you know, approximately 75 million Americans will be over the age of 65 by 2030. Um, and uh, in 2012, a study came out that said, you know, one in five people in this age group uh, will experience a mental health and or um, substance use disorder or both, um, which means that if that ratio persists, uh, we're looking at, you know, 15 million people who are going to be in need, who, uh, who need some support, some help, and to get this addressed. Um, so again, I'm putting some of these statistics out and, and talking about this uh, to normalize, to reduce stigma, to help people not be silent, and to start a conversation. This is part of what it means to be human, and we need to really pay attention to this stuff. Um, and, and to be fair, most likely these numbers are all on the, on the low side. Uh, we get this information from self-report, and self-report is notoriously um, skewed for social desirability and for a uh, lack of disclosure. Uh, so most likely these numbers are, are, are just higher, period. Um, something else that has maybe been on radar because this has been in the news and more spoken about publicly lately, um, you know, we've, we've been hearing about increased suicide rate among adolescents and teens. However, um, the next most prominent group, both for uh, quantity and change and increase um, for suicidal tendencies, behaviors, and co um, completed suicide are people in an older uh, age category. Um, and that's been going up. Um, and that, that group of people has already been uh, vulnerable um, before these recent trends. Um, you know, uh, one line of research shows that older adults are about 12 percent of the population, you know, that'll change, as I said earlier, but um, they make up about 18% of suicides, um, which is, you know, over um, what we would expect. And one reason that um, these numbers can be so much higher in an older population um, is that the, uh, the death rate among um, this group is so much more, uh, we want to say, completed. Um, uh, the follow through is uh, severe. Um, every one in four seniors who uh, attempt suicide complete suicide compared to one in 20, excuse me, one in 200 youths. And that's because people who are older have more access to lethal means. And, uh, you know, probably because of life experience or are, are, are honestly better at doing this. That's not good. But the point is, it's more lethal. <laughs> um, particularly firearms is the big one, which older people tend to have more access to than younger people. And when they engage in that, they do it and they do it well. And that's a big deal. Um, so, you know, not to scare anybody, but just to put out what's happening, what the demographics are looking like and what the trends are starting to look like. Um, so, specifically here, what can be expected as you age in relation to mental health and uh, cognitive healthy functioning um, or changes? Um, there will be changes in impulse control, changes in uh, cognitive functioning, meaning decreased um, reaction times and longer. Um, uh, need to uh, 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 analyze, make decisions, basically slower, slowing cognitive functioning um, and a higher increased rates of social um, isolation. So these are just all things that we see as we get older that you can expect. And I put all those there, again, not to be like, sorry, that's just the breaks. No, it's, it's again to set a benchmark to say, okay, what's really going on with my, my brain in this case is that, um, as we get older, brain structures, particularly the frontal lobe, the part that is executive functioning, impulse control, um, decision-making, analytical thinking, in, uh, inhibition, that stuff like all the rest of our body deteriorates. 
normal, fine. So these are some of the consequences of. And so now that you can know this and expect this, when you have an experience of, I can't figure a word I want to say, am I losing my mind? No, give yourself a moment or two to catch up. <laughs> that's, the, that's where I'm getting at this. Wait, I don't really care if you have an impulse control problem. It's most likely not a crazy problem. Just say, hey, if I'm going to make a large decision, let me sleep on it. You probably do that anyways. But just realize that as you get older, these are really important. And the last point here, uh, increased, re increased rates of social isolation, that's kind of a no kidding correlation. As we get older, the idea of people passing and losing loved ones, friends, and other people we're connected to is the natural part of life. And that'll have an impact on our emotional, cognitive, and psychological functioning. Um, so that increased isolation is a potential um, uh, pitfall or a vulnerability factor as we get older. Um, so, as I'm just looking through my notes, the other thing that I want to point out here is, and again, I'm not an expert in dementia, in um, Alzheimer's, in those things, but I certainly have a familiarity. At one point, there was a, a thought, there was a wondering if, well, maybe if we live long enough, we're all going to develop dementia. That's wrong. Um, so slower cognitive function, fine. But the idea of full-blown dementia, no. You, that is not standard. And you cannot expect that the longer I live, the worse it's going to be. Not at all. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of nip that myth in the bud in case that was something that you may have taken away from these three bullet points. Um, and I won't focus too much time on that aspect, dementia, Alzheimer's, um, but we do know that some of our basic ways to cope and to stave that off are uh, exercise, diet, and um, increased uh, high engagement in cognitive stimulation and increased uh, social connection, period. Um, and if anyone has more questions or specifics, we can always reach out and talk later about that stuff. Um, so hopefully the idea of why mental health matters is pretty obvious now. So, so what is this well-being? What is this well mental health wellness? Um, well-being is a continuous process involving self-awareness, healthy choices resulting in a balanced life. These dimensions of well-being include physical, emotional, intellectual, spiritual, social, cultural, occupational, and or, you know, life purpose and environmental, meaning the context that we live, our home, our community, our environment. Um, so wellness is how all these things work together, how they all contribute to our global sense of um, happiness, content, groundedness. And um, we need to have a process of self-reflection, of adaptation, of making choices in respect to changes, stressors, and those kind of things. I do have something that I would like people to, uh, we can email uh, after this, that kind of captures what all those dimensions are. And I'll just bring it up very briefly. It's this concept here of uh, your individual wellness, and it's all of those factors with a further description of what they mean. So to reference this in the future can be something that hopefully you can take away from this presentation. All right. So moving on from that, as I get this reset. So what, what is needed for well-being and wellness? Feeling engaged and empowered. Obviously maintaining that physical health with rest, diet, and you know, exercise and physical movement. Achieving a balance of life slash work demands and time away from those stressors. Being present, being grounded, being focused on the moment. Obviously understanding one's strengths and limitations as well. Um, you know, I'm going to talk about all these throughout uh, the presentation, um, but uh, you know, as a as a catch-all slide, uh, these are the things that we can work on to stave off uh, degradation in mental health and psychological deterioration. And um, these are the areas that, if we have these uh, proactively or actively keeping to stay up on, can help us weather stressors. Um, and things like that. So, so these are the things that help us cope with stress. What is stress? What, 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 what do I mean by, by that? And that's a huge topic, but generally in a nutshell, what is stress? It can be an external event, some sort of stimulus, some sort of demand acting on us that causes us discomfort, uh, uh, reactivity, distress, 
and uh, some sort of negative influence in our lives. It can be an internal um, comfort. I meant to put the word internal in front of the word discomfort. Point is, it can be an internal sensation, both emotional and physiological, as it says here. It can be a reaction to an event or an internal state. So that the response, both cognitively and emotionally, on how we make sense of and how we respond effectively to some sort of external or internal stimuli. And of course, the concept that all these things are always working together all the time, it's an interaction of all, all the above here. So very briefly, this is probably nothing that's too groundbreaking, um, but at least physiologically, how does our body respond to stress? Um, and this is at least you can help understand like, whoa, physiologically, senses understand what the stress is externally, internally, your brain uh, interprets that in its cortex. It's, if it's interpreted as a stressful, your limbic system sends off a response, fight, flight, freeze, things like your pupils dilate, increased breathing rate, increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, your body is under stress. Um, the point here is, well, stress happens, it's how we cope, work with, and, and function with. So uh, we're all gonna experience distress in uh, spikes because life is life. But if those things stay chronic, or if the event or whatever it is, is significant enough in its own right, it could have deteriorous effects on our mental health. And so we wanna be able to notice stress and then respond to stress. So we don't end up developing anxieties, depressions, um, interpersonal functioning concerns, PTSD, and things like that. Um, so as this slide, you know, what is stress? So what, what should we do with stress? What do we, what do, we do next? Um, The idea is here, how to cope with stress. First, bringing some awareness on what is happening. Um, this is both the um, awareness to how we react to stress on an emotional and a psychological uh, dimension, how we make sense or interpret the distress and stressors. Um, that is very much the cognitive uh, appraisal, meaning-making dimension of ourselves. Coping, we, what do we do? This is the behavioral response to stress, for better or for worse. Now, we're hoping that overall, when we start focusing on psychological, mental health, wellness, that we will cope in ways that are healthy, effective, and useful. But we also know tons of ways that people do things that aren't. Avoidance, um, overreactivity, use of substances for self-medicating, drugs and alcohol. Those are all coping strategies that are still coping strategies. They're just not good in the long run or even the short run sometimes and then of course if, if it's something that is beyond your current um, ability to cope make sense of manage we want to figure out both informal and formal resources to also manage that stress so first on that awareness dimension we want you to be able to know yourself we want you to be able to have some sort of reference point, benchmark, and reflective process. And sometimes it's helpful to use some more objective measures. There's a couple of things here that we can share. And I might bring one of them up very quickly here. But these are all things that are going to measure depression, anxiety, or global uh, dysfunction and um, distress. So PHQ-9 depression, GAD-7 anxiety, distress thermometer is overall um, a wellness domain of how you're doing. Um, so each of these have links. Each of these, I believe, will be provided to you all um, with this presentation in an email after this. Um, and yeah, these are actually clinical tools, but you don't have to be a clinician or have someone who has special training to understand yourself. And that's really the bottom line of looking at this. So like when I click on this one, you're gonna see it talks about the core symptoms of depression. And you ask, your, you're honest with yourself. Uh, does this happen to me several days, uh, half a days of the last two weeks or nearly every day of the last two weeks? Um, and the higher things are, the kind of worse it is in terms of severity. But again, it's, it's self-report. So it's not like it's gonna, if you're lying to yourself, you're lying to this, <laughs> but that's, we want you to have a barometer and we want you to be able to notice uh, when things change. And so using some of these as, you know, maybe you just look at these today and go, well, here's, I'm doing cool, I'm doing fine. Here's where I'm at. 
if you go, God, I'm feeling off two months from now, maybe I should look at this again. Wow, did that change? Now you know. Now you know, ah, I have a little more data and evidence to say something's going on. So after you've kind of done some self-assessment, we say, what happens then? And we talk about some behavioral self-care. And these are things like staying active, uh, food, nutrition intake. I know hydration seems silly, but oh my gosh, it's so critical to not be dehydrated in terms of cognitive processes uh, and dealing with emotional reactivity. Um, right along that sleep, uh, obviously uh, thoughtful and uh, engaged medical care. And when we say vitamin N, what we really mean here is uh, a connection to the world around you in nature so you can feel like you're not just isolated alone but you're part of something these are all behavioral ways i've noticed there's stress in my life i've noticed it's not i'm not doing well with it maybe addressing some of these things behaviorally can help change how i feel how i'm doing and taking care of those emotional psychological dimensions of wellness um, when i say psychological self-care this really means that cognitive, emotional, specifically side of things. Mindfulness, this is a pretty trendy word right now, but all that really means is we want you to be able to slow down, pay attention, and be able to respond to things internally or externally instead of automatically reacting to things that might not be a decent or useful or effective strategy if you're just going on autopilot. And when you can respond, you can have choice to do what works for your beliefs, values, needs, all that kind of good stuff. Um, the concept of meaning making, all that means is when I'm responding to something and I can't control it, the stressor is outside of my control, but maybe I have to look at it effectively so I don't get overwhelmed. It's not catastrophic. It doesn't feel um, extreme or daunting because I'm kind of making it worse than it is and that impacts my mood, my emotions and my mental health. Um, other psychological self-care strategies is you know, the, the concept that I'm making a difference. So God, this thing is out of my control, but I really am able to function well in the world overall. So, so that way you lose some of that negativity bias and it's the belief that you can mm, take care of yourself, take care of others and, and manage what you need to manage. What did I make a difference in today? Um, in a similar vein, something we found psychologically that really helps is gratitude. And usually we say, if you can remember three good things from today, that's gonna help literally change your brain. So it's not so stuck on the negative, but can see the big picture of things. Um, and then what I mean by starting and ending the day, if you're noticing from symptom screeners, from your own self reflection and, and awareness that something's not going well, we want you to be intentional with how you take care of yourself psychologically. How do I start my day? How do I end my day? What happens in between? This is you holding yourself accountable. All right. This next one, coping with stress and talking about social self-care. This kind of goes back to that concept of social isolation that happens um, as we get older. Um, so I'm gonna put all these up real quick. And what I mean here is you wanna have contact. You wanna have specific types of contact with people. You wanna be thoughtful and intentional. Basically, don't take for granted that you have a social network that's always gonna be there. Be active, be thoughtful. It's better to be proactive than reactive. Oh, crap. Here I am 20 years later and I don't have anyone to rely on. What just happened? Wait a minute. We want you to stay engaged as much as possible with things that fit, feel good, and are helpful for you and for other people. We want you, when it says type of contact, not all relationships are equal. Some people you use for emotional support, other people you use to get something done. It's an objective, that's good. You need all these people and these different support people so you can live a balanced life and get your needs met and hopefully help other people too. Um, and what the, the last bullet point there says, social web, create a social web to, web to reduce impact of cognitive narrowing from distress. What happens when we're isolated, if we don't have as much contact, if we're not as interconnected to others, all of a sudden a stressor comes up and I, have my automatic way of making sense of it, but I got no other way to take perspective. I've lost that ability to um, see the big picture. And then no one's there to help me find it because I'm alone or more alone than I once was, which can then create a cycle 
of disengagement, narrowing, and constricting of the way we use our brain, we use our cognitions, and we make sense of things. So when we have lots of people around, some of them might be useless, but some of them will probably be like, hey, have you thought of it this way? You know, there's a different way to look at this. Hey, can I help you make sense of this? And it can pull us up. So yeah, the stressor is there, but we're not gonna get stuck in it as easily. Um, and then a little point here, we talk about social self-care, about social connections. As we get older, as been mentioned, we're gonna lose people because death is part of life. We're also probably gonna lose uh, close family, uh, brothers, sisters, parents, obviously, and uh, spouses. And with this is gonna become grief and mourning. And so grief and mourning, just as a little plug here, is normal, is needed, is important. There's really no wrong way to mourn, excuse me, no right way to grieve. There are wrong ways that when I say wrong, that'll be make things more difficult. Essentially, isolation from a loss makes a loss worse. Essentially, avoiding what you're feeling, thinking, and needing through um, active disengagement, um, through escape, or through the use of substances prevents somebody from having effective meaning making and developing a new normal after the loss of someone important. So the idea here is, while grief and loss can hurt, it's something that we all can manage as long as we don't do things that keep us stuck from that uh, moving into that next phase of what post loss means to us. So the last thing I have here with coping with stress is to develop a stress tolerance plan. Um, focusing on your accomplishments, again, increases that sense of self-efficacy when you're feeling helpless, hopeless, and lost. Emotional shifts. It, it sounds easy, but what I'm getting at here is sometimes when I can't make the stressor go away and I'm feeling crappy, let's do something that feels the opposite of that. It's hard to have two competing emotions be big at the same time. So if you're sad, do something that makes you laugh. And there's actually research that shows even the motions will change. So if I smile, but I really don't feel like smiling, it actually is a conditional response to make us at least shift our emotion states a little bit. Now, I don't want you to fake it. I want you to do something that really <laughs> gets you to a different emotional state. Um, I mentioned the, the gratitude piece, so I won't dwell on that. And then I have <clears throat> two actual things you can use. Uh, one is an app you can have on your phone or your tablet. The other one is a website. When we're in the middle of something, that we can't control and we need to use some emotional processing and um, uh, problem solving skills. Uh, there's an acronym that we use for distress tolerance called accepts, um, which goes through all the different ways. Well, pull it up, goes through a bunch of different ways that we can get through that moment. So we don't, you know, essentially develop a, a worse uh, psychopathology and distress, you know, uh, distract with activities, um, distract with uh, contributing and, and focusing on others, uh, using helpful comparisons, uh, using opposite emotions, pushing away negative thoughts and feelings, uh, changing your thought process and using your five senses are all ways to tolerate the moment. And this webpage outlines those uh, very thoroughly. And I just wanted to give that as a uh, as a uh, tool. Unfortunately, with time, I won't have a ton of space to talk about them. Um, similarly, with this virtual hope box, um, it goes through relaxation, calming, deep breathing, and other ways to tolerate the moment. Um, and what I have here then is the concept of a, of a neighborhood watch, meaning here's my stress tolerance plan. I can hold myself accountable to these things, but guess what? I'm going to give other people permission, and I'm going to want them to pay attention to me in case I'm blindsided, have a bias, have a... Um, a blind spot that I can't see. They're going to say, what's going on? Let's let's get some help. Hey, I'm here for you. Um, and you've given them the permission to do so. Um, so very quickly, because I just about did it, but dang, it's hard to do 20, 30 minutes. Um, point is, if you're worried, reach out and ask somebody. If you're noticing changes in yourself or others, if those symptom screeners go, what just happened? They change dramatically. If you have a serious change in your daily functioning or your subjective distress, you now say, all right, I'm not going to ignore this. I need to talk to somebody. Talk to who? Well, at a minimum, I and other people, at least in the primary care department in Marshfield, but anyone who uh, is uh, one of your providers, one of your doctors, one of your uh, uh, medical resources, 
are a first place to go. Now, this little quote here just means that uh, what I do right now in primary care in Marshfield is uh, I combine uh, medical treatment with behavioral health services. So you can go to one place and at least start to address whatever is going on and you feel that um, you are being supported and getting your needs met. Um, so at least that's a plug for what uh, primary care behavioral health is here at the Marshfield Center. And then um, essentially just to add to that, the primary care uh, behavioral health consultant, uh, my role is to identify, treat, triage, uh, manage uh, this, uh, you're presenting issues with your medical or, or behavioral health team to get you somewhere that is uh, improving your general well-being and daily functioning. So uh, I did a good job staying on 30 minutes, but I don't know how much time we have for questions and for yeah. um, things like that. So yes, that's the end. Great. Um, well, just in essence of time, what I think I'm going to do is everyone that submitted a question during today's presentation, we will send answers to in the follow-up email so that we don't take up any any more time. Um, I don't know if people have lunch hour or, or what their plans are, but um, I just want to say thank you to everybody who joined us for today's presentation and also thank you Dr. DeSimone for joining us as well. I think that I mean, we can all agree that was wonderful information and um, there were a lot of nuggets in there that are good for everybody to take away with them. Um, I don't think I have anything else. I think that's a wrap. And thank you all for having me and of course um, I think it was well said, these are our nuggets, our takeaway points. And so uh, I believe, again, with the follow-up email, with these links, with these resources, I want you all as appropriate as needed to look into them. This is a starting place, square one. And now hopefully you have some direction on where to go next. And then just continue to reach out, ask for help, utilize the support that we have here in the Marshfield uh, healthcare system. And uh, I hope that this has been you know, it's somewhat useful for you all. So thank you for having me. Thank you. And um, for everybody on the call today, thanks again. And we hope to see you next month. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. Be well.